Hinda Barmini, welcome to a special edition of Podcast and Chill. Uh, today we're going to be talking about issues that uh, young people are facing each and every day. I'm talking about sexual reproductive health, uh, gender-based violence, and a whole lot more. And luckily I'm not alone today. I'm going to be joined by some very young influencers, and I'm going to be joined by Tippi, so from the National Department of Health, uh, to shed some light and... Uh, shed their stance on these issues. So yeah, get ready for jam-packed show. So much happening, so little time. Hashtag unscripted normal. If it is your first time tuning into the show, make sure you do subscribe to my channel. Uh, make sure you like it and you can also share. All right, so Lebo uh, your journey starts online. Uh, take me back to that tweet that you put out. What was going through your mind? What was happening? Um, basically, I just wanted to know how other people um, are feeling about um, this whole um, COVID-19 and um, the use of contraceptives because I basically went with my girlfriend um, to the clinic. She was getting her pills and i was getting condoms for myself and then um what happened is that they told us that we need to be screened for COVID 19. and my question was but now we are coming here to only get contraceptives and what 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 is the reason for us to be screened or tested for 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 COVID 19 but, but then they explained uh, um that it, it, it's a procedure that needs to happen. So I wanted to know what other people are thinking about this whole thing and the use of contraceptives. And, and since that tweet, uh, what, is, uh, what are people saying? How are they feeling? Um, from that tweet, people are like, okay, it's just a standard procedure to be screened for, 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 for COVID-19. Um, it's just them checking your temperature, asking you a few questions, if you have had um, any symptoms of the virus and, 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 and everything, you know, because you must know that we were on level five and everyone was at home. So me and my girl we were like indoors all the time. And when our, my condoms finished and her pills, and it was like her date to go and fetch her pills. So we, decided that let's go together and then let's just uh, uh, see. But then to our surprise, it was that we were told that we need to be uh, screened for that. But people, like I can see from the tweet, the response that I was getting from my followers is that, no, it's a standard procedure. You don't have to worry about anything, you know. And then, yeah, that was it. All right, cool. I want to bring in uh, Clement. You might know him from Scheme Sum. Uh, because uh, he uh, is also in a committed relationship. He's married, and contraceptives uh, play a very big deal in their relationships. Clement, how are you, my brother? I'm all right, man. How are you? Great, man. I'm here with Libu Khang, and I just wanted to find out from you. First of all, whose decision was it to introduce contraceptives in your marriage? Um, I think, I think, and I hope you understand, it was, a big, it, it was coming from both of us because, um, you know, I already have a child, right? And we started talking about family planning. And I wanted, you know, when you, are in a, when you are in a committed relationship, you always need to make sure that both parties are on the same page and you agree on whatever is affecting your future. So I was like, yo, um, yes, now we have a child, but can we afford more kids? You know, <laughs> and, the question, and the answer was like, not at the moment, because we're still trying to balance career as well. You know, it's like, okay, no, we're doing well for now, but maybe we should wait a bit more before we can get, you know, uh, more kids. And then now it was a matter of, then how do we make sure that we eliminate um, an element of surprise whereby we wake up one day and we're like, ah, baby, we are expecting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and especially during this lockdown, because, you know, uh, there's plenty of time where we quarantine together and sometimes we just watching movies and, you know, enjoying each other's company. So it was very important to start talking about contraceptives, even though some guys said to me on, I can't remember if it was Twitter or Facebook saying, ah, Mara, when almost you are married, you mustn't talk about contraceptives i was like your family planning is very important so that decision i think came from both of us to say let's be on contraceptives uh, to 
to to try and make sure that we can have a child when we are ready to have a child. And do you think uh, that's why, as black people, we have so many kids? Because <laughs> no, it seems as taboo to, to, to talk about contraceptives, like you're saying, you know, especially when you're married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's lack of information, especially from uh, mm. where I come from. I'm a villager, and a lot of people and the youth, uh, especially back at home, they 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 don't mm. have access to information. Even now, they don't know that you can go to your nearest clinic and you know get contraceptives, uh, because the lockdown regulations gazette says that you can have access to um, health services even during lockdown. So a lot of our youth are not exposed to such. Um, information so that's why they end up maybe you know having kids or maybe the rate of teenage pregnancy is high at, at, at some areas all right i want to bring in uh dr moose uh he's a he's a tv personality he's a doctor of course and also he's uh uh melissa kikawa's former son <laughs> <laughs> Can you respect me? Can you respect me? Uh, how are you, Dr. Moose? Are you good? I love him kicking, I love him kicking, gents. Uh, I hear you guys have been having a lot of fun without me, but I'm here now. Yeah, man. Let's just start off with uh, for you as a doctor, what is the importance of, of contraceptives in your field? The, the important thing for contraceptives uh, with regard to us uh, more medically is I think the major component of it is a family planning one where we want women to have the choice to be able to say when they want to have their children and therefore make informed decisions about when that will be. So if you're sitting there, you're young, you still have things that you want to achieve in your life, you want to go work, you want to go get married, whatever it might be for you. We want you to be able to make that decision about when you want to have your children. And then, of course, you know, contraceptives have got additional effects that they have for the people that do use them, uh, barring any contraindications or any reasons why you shouldn't be on that medication. Uh, they really do help out in those conditions as well. So we really, really do encourage women to go out there and get on a family planning sort of contraceptive method. Well, Musa, is this you? Last time... <laughs> 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 I think he has just put on his medical head now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm expecting him to link to a cartoon or something. <laughs> yeah, I can do that too. I can do that too. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, man. Uh, so tell us some about some. Uh, tell us about some of the misinformation, like you're saying about contraceptives, because I've heard girls say, like, you know, I don't want to use it because some of the side effects is gaining weight. So, look, there are side effects, and it's important to recognize the different side effects that come with the different types of contraception that you are wanting to get on. So, that's a very important thing that you must know. So, it's very important when you go to the clinic, when you go see your doctor, that you do say, listen, this is my health profile. I'm allergic to A, B, C, and D. Um, I've got this family history of such and such. So, that they get a full profile of you so they can put you on the right contraceptive device for you. And I mean, these range generally from uh, things that you'd want to use. We all know about, you know, condoms for males and females, uh, but you also get other things else, such as tablets, you get injectables, you get uh, implants that you can put in your body, you put uh, you get IUDs that you could use as well. So there are a number of contraceptive devices that can be used uh, by people that want to engage in contraceptive use, um, but it's important to know which one works best for you and what will work best for your body. And therefore, when you know what will work for you, you can pick the one that's got the least amount of side effects that you can experience. But the nice thing about it is that it's contraceptive. So the moment you realize that it's not working well for you or your body is not receiving it uh, the way that you'd anticipate it to be received, then you can always change to another method because that always works as well. So it, sometimes it requires a bit of uh, figuring out what, to, what can work, what's going to work. But some people just get it right the first time and I have been on their one contraceptive for the longest time. So you also spoke about the misconceptions that people have around contraceptives. A big one is that no, it never works or isn't as effective um, at all times and you end up getting pregnant whether you're on it or not. I mean, there are different types of contraception. An important one, I think, with regards especially to lockdown, Next week is opening up. We know what that means, right? People are going to visit. <laughs> uh, so so if, you, if, you are, if you are someone that was uh, on a contraceptive or you ended up defaulting or have never been on a contraceptive and you're going to engage in sexual activity, it's important 
to know that on top of just the normal contraceptives that you can be on, there is also emergency contraception. So this is the pill that you can buy at the pharmacy that will help you in an emergency yeah. situation within that three-day period after you've had unprotected sex or a condom has burst or, you know, you were in the heat of the moment. Whatever it might be for you, <laughs> there are many <laughs> options available to you to prevent you not wanting children that or not having children you don't want. All right, let me start with uh, Lego Khan. What question do you have for Dr. Moose? Um... With regards to um, condoms, do, do uh, are condoms considered as a contraceptive? As a contraceptive, because my friends, um, some didn't respond like on the tweet, but they saw it and then they called me like, "Why am I going to get contraceptives?" And I told them that condom it, it's it's part of a contraceptive. So can you please? clear that up and in, in regards to that are condoms um regarded as contraceptives yeah so condoms are regarded as contraceptive method so contraception by nature or by definition is the prevention of something so the condoms and the nice thing about condoms is that they prevent two things in this case so you're preventing a pregnancy uh in this mm -hmm. case and also you're preventing getting STIs or STDs in the situation. So a lot of people say they're on contraceptives, so they'll take their pill, but won't be doing things like being on PrEP. They won't um, be using condoms and things such as that. That will make them be at a higher chance of getting STIs and STDs. So condoms, male and female, are contraceptive devices that you can use to prevent you getting pregnant, but also prevent you getting STIs. STIs. Okay, right. cool. No, thank you. And Clement, uh, what question do you have for Dr. Moose? Uh, for me, firstly, I think uh, he's aware of the sexual reproductive health rights. And I just need to know from him if he thinks that uh, the youth are aware of that and if they are exercising that. But secondly, I think a lot of people do want to go to the health centers, right? But there's this stigma around COVID where they feel like, I'm going there just to get my contraceptives but now they want to screen me for corona and, you know, I'm not sure if I want to know whether I have it or not. So what kind of um, advice does he have for the youth who are in that kind of uh, mentality? Yeah, so a number of things to address there. The first bit is access to information or knowing something is not bad for you. So people that say, I might have corona, but I don't want to go confirm it. That doesn't help you at all. Because all you do is you sit there without information and you have anxiety and you're worried and it perpetuates this thing in your head of you not knowing, which doesn't help you with anything. I mean, let's, we're all Gen Z. We've all done an HIV test before in our lives. Now, even if you hadn't had sex for four years, when you go test for HIV, you are panicking. Your heart is doing this the whole time. <laughs> that you're waiting for the result to come out. Oh, yeah. And that's the reality of the matter. Even if you know you haven't done anything, you know. And that's the reality of life. So the same thing can be said about coronavirus is that when you are scared that, hey, listen, hey, I'm feeling a bit of a scratchy throat or hey, someone was coughing around me yesterday, going to the facility and getting screened literally is just a basic screening uh, process. If we consider you someone who is a person under investigation or someone that we have an interest in because your neighbor who you chatted to for 30 minutes last week without wearing masks, you know, there we start thinking, okay, there may be things that we need to check for here and then we'll do the actual test to diagnose the coronavirus at this point in time. So that's one element. But the one about the sexual um, reproductive rights is a very important one to note as well. Because there, it's... Look, we live in South Africa where sexual liberation and sexual discussions are very tricky to have. Um, as a young person, you may not find it easy to walk into a facility at the age of 15 because you feel like you want to have sex. You and your girlfriend have decided as 15-year-olds that you guys want to have sex. You're going to find it very difficult to go to a health facility and say, hi, we would like to get condoms. I'd like my girlfriend, uh, who we've also agreed on, she would also like to get onto a contraceptive device. I want to take condoms home so that we can go have this consexual sex that we want to have amongst ourselves. That's a very difficult thing to have, especially also in and around discussions around you talking to your parents about sex. And the issue is the communities that we live in also have us going to the facilities that are within our communities because it doesn't make sense for me to leave Soweto to drive to Tembisa just so I can go get condoms and family planning because I don't want people to see me in my neighborhood that I'm having sex. We need to create an environment within our health system that allows young people 
at any age that they feel they want to have sex at, or any age they feel they want to go collect contraceptives, that they should walk into any facility and be able to get youth-friendly services from these facilities that can help them in all aspects. For you as a 15-year-old to say, I want to have sex, this decision that I have made, and I want to talk to this nurse and this doctor about getting onto something. If they don't reciprocate a friendly, open discussion with me, it makes it tricky for me to say, hey, maybe I should use condoms. What you end up doing is you say, you know what, uh, I, I'm just going to take Nomasondo, we're going to go to my back room, in my cousin's back room somewhere, and we're going to have sex because I'm too scared of what's going to happen when I get to the clinic. They're going to ask me way too many questions. They're not going to want to help me. They're going to tell me, no, you're too young to be having sex. And we forget that all of the stuff is personal. I mean, sexual reproductive health rights are personal things. No one should infringe upon that. That's my belief on it. So if you want to do something and are of age and you should be doing it and can be doing it, go ahead. But we need to, as a health system, support you in all the ways that we can and should help you. Wow. Nicely said. Uh, just in closing, Lubokong, uh, what do you want to say? Oh, well, um, from my side, um, the information that I uh, just received from the gents, uh, from Clement and Musa, um, I think um, I'm going to use it going forward and to educate other people within my community because I stay in Soweto 22. So I will try and uh, com uh, communicate and engage with other youth members within my area. So to hear what they say or what they think regarding this matter. But in, in closing, I'd like to thank uh, um, Musa and, and, and Clement, especially Musa, the, the information that you just gave out now, um, it's proper, proper information. All right, and for you, as for you, Clement, uh, your last words, what do you want to say? Uh, for me, I think uh, my message should be to young people who are so energetic and active when it comes to uh, sexual pleasure that uh, you still have the right to access um, health centers and you can continue your health routines as before COVID-19. So a lot of people now, if they were on contraceptives, for an example, they might think that, oh, because of COVID now, I must just stay home and not use protection or contraceptives. So I'm saying to them that uh, you are still allowed to continue your sexual routines as normal for as long as you exercise uh, precautions. And we all follow the regulations as gazetted in the, uh, uh, as gazetted by the government rather to, continue uh, going to, to, to medical centers and clinics around us and exercise proper care. Fantastic. And are we planning on having another baby soon? Uh, in future, yes. I think <laughs> I need a lot, actually. I think I really need a lot. But I said earlier on, hold on. I said earlier on that family planning is very important. And yeah. I can't wait for Mosa to also join in. <laughs> yeah, what is your situation, Musa? Are you using contraception? Uh, I, I, or are you, yeah. are you busy there, have Chief? Fun, have fun there by yourselves, boys. Can I tell you something? There seems to be a very, a very, strong, a very strong agenda uh, from the people that have children. This agenda to make other people have children as well. And we are okay. We don't mind being uncles. It's really fine for us to go play with the child for 20 minutes on a Saturday and be out of there before the child starts crying. We're okay with that. We don't need anything else. When we are done and are thinking about our family planning for the future, yeah, then maybe we'll have... But for now, we're okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Dr. Moose. Decisions, doctor. Thank you, man. Uh, any last words from you, Dr. Moose? Uh, mine is simple. I think we need to start destigmatizing sex, one. And I say destigmatize because there's this bad thing that we've thrown around sex. And sex is a natural, normal thing that happens whether we like it or not. So destigmatize it. Start having frank and open discussions in and around it. I like what we've done in this four-parter here with the four of us being available. That as guys, we also need to discuss contraception. Where amongst ourselves, the only contraception guys ever discuss is the morning after which makes no sense to me. Yeah, the only discussion amongst four guys will be morning after. It's never condoms. It's never, hey, me and my girlfriend sure. have decided that we want to go discuss or go to the family, cl uh, family planning clinic and sit down with your girlfriend next to the nurse and say, yeah, what are the options? We need to have these frank discussions in and around whole thing that is sexual reproductive rights. And after all of that, then we can move forward. After we've allowed conversations to 
flow conversations to occur, then people will realize that sex isn't this taboo, mythical thing that should be hidden underneath the sheet, but should be openly discussed so that it is normal and known, and then people will feel a lot more freer about going to facilities and collecting what they should be getting to protect themselves. Couldn't have said it better myself. Guys, thank you so much for taking time out to speak with me today. Really enjoyed it. It was very fruitful. And I hope a lot of people watching this enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, stay safe. Keep loving life. I appreciate so much, man. Oh, thank, well, you, man. thank you so much, man. So much, man. All right, so joining me right now to continue to dis- uh, the discussion on uh, sexual reproductive health rights, I'm joined by Kiabe Etsui. Uh, who's an online influencer. She probably has the most famous tweet of all time. <laughs> you are king. <laughs> how are you, Kia? I'm good, thanks. And how are you? I can't complain. Great, man. Listen, before we talk about sexual reproductive health rights, um, yeah, I want to yeah, ask sure. you about your tweet, where you are king. Um, I'm sure it's she changed your life, eh? Like, do you remember when you first like- put it out? People always ask me this question and I don't know how to answer because like, it's like they're expecting something more than what I'm giving them. Um, but it was on the 5th of January, like 2019, you know, and I was sitting in the kitchen and then, you know, and then I asked, like there was no plan of execution, couple thought, much thought put into my head. I just asked. And then, yeah, when it started, people, was like saying light-hearted things like Bajuwaki the mosquito, um Bajuwaki Chalete, and then getting into the tweet, I think that's when it started getting a bit deep because people were like venting and using it as a platform to 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 seek help, you know. Yeah. And do you remember the first celebrity to comment on that tweet? Yo, I can't. I can't remember, but I know Casper your vest. Some of them didn't even comment on it. They like spoke about it. Like, yo, that was your working is, is, is heavy. Like I know Maps Mapanyanu was like, yo, that was a heavy tweet. Um, Casper your vest has been the one that's been actively speaking on Ojoaki. Ojoaki Budutu, Ojoaki, Owenokoyajimi, what is looking at Syria? And then I think, yo, I can't remember, but I think a lot of celebrities had a lot to say about it. All right. And Kia, a lot once of again, celebrities blocked me as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kia. Once again, thank you so much for joining me uh, th- uh, today. All right. Uh, thank let, you so much for having me. Yeah. Let's chat about sexual reproductive health rights. What's your take on it? Okay. So my take on it is that choosing to gain knowledge in terms of one's sexuality, you know, and sexual reproductive health and rights is one's state of mind, and I don't think it exists in isolation of of your mindset. You know, just as good health is a person being in a state of complete um, mental, physical, social, and, you know, just emotional um, well-being, so is to sexual health. And um, um, I think a lot of people are just misinformed in terms of what sexual health really is, you know? And I, I posed a question today on Twitter and then I asked them, what do you think, sex, what, 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 sex, what does sexual health mean to you and i've got some interesting answers you know and but a lot of people also had um if i can say um um a lot to say about what sexual health is in terms of it being knowing your status um it being the prevention and treatment of stis also it being you taking the responsibility to take um protection for yourself and to say that and then I sleep with someone Someone also said um, it's sleeping with sexual health means sleeping with one person uh, because what spirits they carry. And I think what I liked most about um, the answers that I got from uh, my question was a lot of people actually went to the internet. Well, this is babala, but ebulela ing, and then came back to my tweet to to write her sexual health again. And then one person ahugela hona arakia was saying, na nige na na kofela sexual health eki amuto arabala le muto aywan kapo amuto arabala le le muto a healthy. Well, this is marakia. Well, this is our entry. It's something ibe toya butkalo. Do you understand? And 
and again, and a lot of people haba 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 so tilika haba in tilika to yeah yeah yeah. Ma pila bona kapo into like kato sa badi kang ka ka kabusto ko ba ure ba ba ito ko mela jambo pilo. Oh, this is and then. One interesting answer that I also liked um, was that sexual health requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, you mm-hmm. know, as well as the possibility of um, a pleasurable and safe sexual experience, um, free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. Mm-hmm. And social media does play uh, quite a huge role in doing that. Quite a huge role in asking a lot of questions that people yeah. don't necessarily always ask themselves as well. So, yeah. and, and, and I like the fact that you bring up social media. As a social media influencer, what part do you think you have to play in spreading the message about sexual reproductive rights? In terms of also being an influencer, you get to choose what you want to put out. When I influence the creator, I will be able information as well. But I will be able to get the information as well. So as a socialite myself, if I'm given the opportunity to speak about social, or just even mental health, social, 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 social stuff, I do that, you know, because it's quite important as, as I have quite a reach and a wide audience. So social media does play quite a huge role in that. And what advice can you bring, uh, can you give to young people out there who might be suffering from mental health, but, you know, can't find the ways and means to speak out about it? Sometimes it's, 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 it's advisable to speak to a stranger because um, they'll judge them. You know, when you speak to someone that you know. But speaking out is, is definitely what I'd advise. Um, I think there's a, there's a depression and anxiety group on Twitter. It's called South African Depression and something group, SADAC, on Twitter. It, whenever someone speaks a couple of hints for what will commit suicide, I usually tag um, that, that account at, yeah, yeah, two. Come home. All right. And lastly, uh, I'm sure when you are on social media, uh, as we've all seen on Twitter, a lot of uh, GBV um, cases and files and tweets come up. Uh, What's your take on that, on gender-based violence? What do you think, Eskia? Yo, we see quite a lot of that, especially myself, especially on Ujuaki Inc, because people speak about things, unimaginable things, you know, and... That's when they. That's where they often seek help as well. So my take on it is, ubu women like, hot hardene ubu, but do it, you know, in terms of gender-based violence. And it's a hala holo. Kibon it's a hala holo ele ele family e so tanga family enwe, you know. Because I got a tweet not so long ago actually. Um, it was a. A neighbor, on a boy who is married next door, or she is working on a high, um, one more neighbor, Mary, my boy is a half feet, a half a bottom male, one hand. So if you don't speak up, I don't think you 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 are prone to getting the help that you need. So speaking up is quite important, vital, if I can say. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for those wise words. Uh, long may uh, uh, King continue. Uh, but just in closing, <laughs> Thank you. I need to ask you a question, a very fundamental question, a question that I think everybody <laughs> wants to ask you. Yeah. When na ujua king? Hana jali, hana jali na ki ujua ki lockdown ushe. Ah, khate tse, ah boda kutili. Dijo di afela, ku dijo khate zuko na ku le noche na moja hasa wa ja hasa wa jalo. โอ้ยแล้วมันโอ้ยกี่กูดูเอ้ยกูสิจะกินเซจังดิสลิปปิ้งแคทดิลิฟิกดิสิเยยเยกูโอ้ฮุดิเวยเออดิสิจะกินเ
Kia, thank you so much, man. It's been a pleasure always chatting to you and uh, good luck with thank all your future so adventures. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Cheers. My name is Tepiso Machawa Pala. Yes, I'm a gender focal person from the National Department of Health. Um, yeah. Can we start with your job? What does it entail? Tell us more about your job. Okay, being a gender focal person means uh, you have a policy oversight role. Uh, it entails that you have to ensure that the organization is aligned with both the international and the national prescript. Uh, nationally, you have to ensure that uh, the organization is aligned with the Gender Equality Act. And then internationally, you have to observe uh, prescripts such as CEDO, such as uh, setup protocols, such as Beijing platforms. So you always have to be in check with what is the international and what is in the international platforms uh, in terms of the legislations and prescripts. Yes, and uh, ensure that the organization in terms of programs, project policies, they are aligned with such policies. All right, let's, uh, I want to talk about contraceptives and then later on we'll talk about gender-based violence, but let's start with contraceptives. As young people, um, you know, you've seen on social media, they've had a lot to say about contraceptives and access to the clinic during this time. What is your stance as the National Department of Health regarding adhering to contraceptives? Uh. Sexual and reproductive health and rights are, are human rights, you know that. And then, yes, there should be access to uh, contraceptives for uh, young people and adults and people. But we know that we had a challenge during the lockdown where most of the focus was uh, around the COVID-19 and the awareness around COVID-19 and the lockdown and movement was limited and restricted. So, yes, it was important for people to continue with their uh, contraceptives because if they defaulted then that means we're going to have a high rate of teenage pregnancies because they would have stayed at home they'll be lingering around but then we are not also expecting them to experience such because we will expect them to have stayed at home and and have been safe years but then we are still saying because contraceptives they have timelines you have to go some they need you to go there for uh, every three months some need you to go there every month so therefore we are expecting you to have a uh, 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 adhered to whatever is required to pay your contraceptive unless if you you have a the iud or a long-term kind of contraceptives and uh, has there been a rise in the number of young people taking contraceptives during the lockdown? At this moment, I would not be able to confirm because I don't have the data uh, towards that, but I would expect that it should be normal or minimal because of the movement that was limited. Remember, other young people are on contraceptives while their parents don't know and some are still afraid to inform their parents that they're using contraceptives. So you find that there's a situation or complexity of the situation whereby young people are not going to do their uptake because of that situation. Like when they're at school, it's not as simple as when they're home. So yes, where there's freedom for them to access yeah, I, I suppose they've been accessing them because it was available. It was not closed down. Yes. And uh, what other measures is the department putting in place to make sure that access to clinics is uh, adhered to by young people? Uh, we have uh, different platforms like BYs and and she conquers kind of website where people can where young people can access information on uh, the youth zones and how they can access their services from the clinics. We also have Love Life. Love Life is it's, uh, quite dominant in terms of uh, accessing young people and help, helping young people to access health services. So we are not having much of the challenge with young people except young people them opening themselves up to access such platforms to communicate their needs. But BYS is very much advanced and, and good in terms of young people being able to go on the web and then communicate and converse their challenges. So I would not think we would have much of a challenge because we are already ahead 
before even the COVID-19 situation uh, to reach young people in terms of uh, social media. And uh, what are some of the stats? I want to talk about gender-based violence here now uh, for a second. Uh, what are some of the stats regarding that? And, and what is the, uh, the department's stance against uh, JBV? The statistic in terms of gender-based violence is said to be very high. Uh, the, the command center, a call center, it's reporting that the, the call in of the people who are suffering from gender-based violence, both psychologically, emotionally, and physically, has gone up. I don't have the command center's information in terms of the data they, they are communicating towards. But then I know that uh, the reporting is very high at this time and the call in is very high. And there's a challenge whereby uh, the issues of social distancing is uh, giving some form of challenge with uh, shelters and uh, safety homes and whereby people are afraid to report like this, a form of underreporting in terms of women who are being abused at home. Some people are afraid that they're going to lose their jobs, so they're going to depend on the very same person who's abusing them at home. So there are those kind of challenges that are faced at the moment. There are lots of dilemmas that comes with COVID-19, especially with reporting gender-based violence. And if you, you don't know if you're supposed to be dependent on the very same person who's abusing you or you're going to continue working because we know that lots of uh, jobs are going to be shared, lots of stress is going to escalate. Even the abusers themselves, some people are going through uh, psychological and emotional stress because some people are not going to be able to provide for their families. And we read uh, and we, we get to know that some people, because of the lack of alcohol consumption, they become depressed and they are taking their partners because they were drowning uh, their stresses on alcohol. But then at the same time, we also get the reports that uh, gender-based violence has actually gone a little bit down because of lack of availability of alcohol, because some people, they consume alcohol and therefore they abuse their partners. So those are... Uh, the variant uh, issues that are being presented in terms of this situation during the period of the lockdown. But we are still to see to it as to whether the stress has really gone up or uh, if it's only the issue of psychological abuse. But we do hear uh, here and there whereby children are actually being abused. And then with children, the vulnerability is very high because if they are locked down with the very same person who's abusing them, they're not able to run to the nearest people to, re to report because they are with that person like full time. So those are some of the challenges in terms of accessing people who are being abused and uh, how do people even within uh, the civil society access them is another challenge. Now, I just want you to forget about your title for a second. And mm -hmm. I want to ask you a question as, you know, Tepi, so the person, a young black uh, African female woman in this world. Where do you think, um, from your experiences, GBV uh, stems from? And how can we as a society stand up against it? Uh, Gender-based violence stems from different uh, perspectives and situations. Like, to start with, when I say perspectives, I'm saying when we're talking gender equality, remember there are people who are actually revolting against the issue of gender, uh, gender equality, who feels like women are coming in to take over their jobs. Uh, my perspective is that uh, I think it's sort of a revenge towards the situation where it's at. It's disempowerment. It's a lack of understanding of the people who are abusing uh, the victims. Uh, it's sort of uh, trying to uh, dominate the other gender it's it's other variety of things like maintaining control uh, of men they it, 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 uh, like especially men I, i'm saying men because dominantly it's women who are reporting uh, men who are abusing them but yes in most instances i'll say it's it's a power uh, it's a power issue it's a power control issue um whereby somebody wants to exert their power upon the other person, they want to control the other person. And uh, in my perspective, also the economic status, uh, like at the moment, like people are unemployed, they feel disempowered, they feel like they, they are emasculated because uh, another partner is working, where women are getting higher positions, um, 
they feel like they're less competent as compared to before because there was no addressing of the situation before there was no redress actually from even the apartheid system remember women suffered a triple oppression it was from colonization it came to apartheid and then uh, gender inequality so all those levels of oppression uh, people normalized them they were adapted as a normal kind of a form of, of, of life. But then when redress came, it was then uh, men had a counteract on that. Like when you listen to most men talking about women, they are talking of women as objects more than as human beings who are capable and able to think we have their own brains, we have to stand on their own. The other issues that are driving those kind of uh, violence are you can say religion because some people use a religion to oppress and abuse women. You can say tradition because some people use tradition and culture to oppress women. So I'll tell you that it's different situations that are giving a birth to different kind of uh, abuse and oppression because some people are even abused in church and we can't deny that no matter how much we can try to run from that. Some people are abused because of culture, because uh, culture believes that uh, people should go through a certain process or you must get married or you must uh, stay with a man who married you and die in your marital family. Those are some of the things that are giving unnecessary power to other genders. And also uh, to want to push people uh, or to impose people to follow certain forms of culture. Like to say you're a woman, you have to do this. So when you are in the LGBTIQ groups, you are not accepted. You are prone to be abused by society because you are within the n not normal kind of a population. So people are not yet receptive. Well, not all, but some, some pockets of members of society. And because some people are still afraid to come out, you find that they are subjected to those kinds of abuses because they are forced to conform to a certain type of life when they want to live a particular type of life. Even those people who are not in the LGBTIQ groups uh, who are choosing to live life in a particular way, they, they find themselves being victimized because they choose to live in a particular way. Young women these days are choosing that they don't want to have kids, they want to prosper, they want to further their careers. You find that they're being abused for choosing that kind and uh, society sort of ostracized them for those kind of choices in life. Yeah, for me, from my perspective, not from anyone's perspective. All right, so with that said, um, what can young people do to stand up against this and take action against GBV? To be honest, I think young people in this generation are doing good. I think they are working hard at uh, redressing the situation. If you look at Twitters, uh, the, the tweets that they're putting up there, they're fighting, they're being robust against uh, discriminations, oppressions, uh, sidelines. Uh, I think they're not uh, permitting this to happen and I think the only thing is that their male counterpart might be very much intimidated and become despondent in terms of uh, working alongside them. The only good thing is where uh, their young male uh, counterparts towards uh, the, the feminists that are rising, the new feminist generation that is rising up right now. Uh, the good thing is when they join uh, forces with them then it addresses the situation but there are those who go for back and forth who are reverting back to the old ways who, uh, who want to do things the way they were done in the olden times. But the challenge is young women now are getting educated, they're becoming independent. They're also facing new challenges in life versus uh, the generations before them. So that is why they feel empowered to stand up and, and voice their concern. If you can remember, the total shutdown was mostly made up of young people and they did a good job because they shook uh, the situation to a point whereby the president had to address them and then we had a, a GBV command center. And right now, 
we are having the call center where uh, young people can call in, where people who are abused can call in. Like GBV was not so much put on the top of the agenda. And then they felt that it was enough when it was attacking them in, in tertiary institutions. And they felt that this is a serious matter that needed an urgent attention. And therefore I applaud them. I don't think they're just sitting on a situation and ignoring what is happening around them. And I'm saying they should press forward. They should not change their culture of, of uh, uh, tackling issues and, and combating whatever that is coming their way. And I appreciate their way of, of being radical in addressing issues that are coming to them, even though uh, it freaks out the generations <laughs> that are older. <laughs> we know that. But then I'm saying their way of doing things, they, they shouldn't deflate. They, in, instead, they must move forward. They must push with force. And they shouldn't let us, uh, the other generation, to, uh, Dictate. to discourage them mm, with our mm. fears. Yes. We, they should not be deterred. Mm. They must push forward. Like the same way apartheid was fought, uh, was fought is the same way they must fight gender-based violence. And as young women and young men, I say they must stand up and fight. Uh, because... In this generation, if you don't fight for what you want, you're not going to get it. So I think they did a good thing and they must continue. Uh, the, the energy they had with the total shutdown is the energy they must continue in and they must continue with because they did something. They did a uh, shape shift uh, 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 situations that were facing the society right then because GBV was escalating at a very faster rate. But even now we have GBV, but it's not as bad as it was mm. becoming fashionable. And mm. people were just looking on uh, helplessly without knowing what is it that is the cause of the problem. But if you look at most of the cases, it's, it's more about uh, disempowering young women and yeah. trying to take the control back of young men or, or men in, in particular. But I have not yet observed uh, the behavior of younger men in this generation. But I think because they're seeing a trend, sometimes uh, most younger people are learning from the societal trends and, and the social cultures that they find themselves in and therefore they fall on. But I think they, they got shook by the act of the total shutdown uh, youth that acted then. And I'm still saying we need those kind of, of young people who are vibrant, who are alive, who stand up, who voice their issues, who don't sit back and uh, allow uh, the situation to just spiral out of control. I hope I answered your question. No, you did. You did more than answer my question. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> uh, lastly, I just want to ask, what can the department or what is the intention of the department going forward? Uh, what are you going to be doing to provide support needed to make women safe? Listen, at the moment, the challenge is how do we align whatever that we've been doing in towards uh, supporting through technology. Because remember, most of the things have moved to uh, doing digital. through yeah. technology, like yeah. Zoom. Yeah, we are going digital and, and we are at the social medias and in a safe space. Like how do we do open space in a safe way? Mm. especially addressing issues of gender-based violence. We know the risks that are attached with that because sometimes you will think you're talking to the victim and you find that you are addressing the perpetrator and you are giving them new skills of attacking uh, the, the victims. But then at the same time, we are saying, how do we then use technology as a tool to access and, and serve those people who are in need of it, especially in terms of psychological support, uh, mental health, we know GBV can cause uh, serious trauma. And so even for people who are not actually uh, experiencing GBV, but people around the person who's affected and, and who's experiencing gender-based violence. So how do we deal with those situations? We need to learn how technology can actually uh, uh, help us forward. We need to learn new ways in the new normal. And it, that is, I think, the, the challenges that we are facing right now to say how safe because uh, GBV on its, on its own, like addressing it, it needs very safe spaces. That is why people are put in shelters. That is why even areas where uh, GBV is addressed, they need high protection and high security. So how then do we have a secure open spaces to then address? I think now we are standing at those kind of challenges. And how do we pair? Because right now we are in the COVID-19 situation. How do we pair the screening of COVID-19 with that of gender-based violence, whereby you get into a home, you are screened for GBV, and uh, you are screened for COVID-19. How do you then 
also uh, integrate the issues of GBV? How are you going to observe and see because of the kind of the situation that we are facing? I think COVID-19 disrupted lots of things because we were still coming up with the tools of addressing and screening GBV, but then it erupted the whole processes where we had to go back to the drawing board and think how then do we do things in a new normal. So those are some of the challenges because we have to keep social distancing. We still have to keep social distancing and uh, protect ourselves even when the lockdown is lifted because remember, we still don't have the vaccine. But then how do we help people who need our help even with the constraints that we are facing. And the resources to raise around how to access those people and their access, how, how do we support them even with their basic needs? Because with GBV, those people also need basic needs because most of the time it's, it's people who can't fend for themselves. It's people who are in a situation where they're dependent on a perpetrator. Even on a situation where they're not dependent on the perpetrator, how do you access them to guide them to say, this is how you then get out of the space you are in. But thanks to the uh, call center for the uh, GBV command center, uh, whereby people can call in and support their cases and get counseling online and be helped on, on what to do. Wow. Tsepi, so thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to shed some light on this topic and long may it continue. Thank you so much. And if you ever decide to leave the department, I think you should start uh, your own podcast. We are waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Am I that talkative? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tepi. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, Maxi. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. All right, so it's time for our final segment of the show, and I'm joined by Sandy Le from Groundbreakers. Uh, Grand boy. Easy, man. I see you've got some toys there in front of you. You're about to demonstrate some stuff. Uh, it's going to be get lit, Moose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm about to show you a thing or two about putting on a condom. Okay, cool. Before we get into that, let's just talk about you and what it is uh, that you do at the Contact Center for Groundbreakers. Um, first things first, my name is Sandy Lepakhoi. I'm a groundbreaker for Love Life. And I'm a groundbreaker placed and based at the, co- at the Contact Center for the Love Life. Uh, I'm an aspiring counselor. I've been job shadowing. I'm a professional counselor and professional psychologist in helping the messes out there through over the phone call. So I've been an upcoming counselor, a facilitator, you know, um, pushing the content, which Love Life is about in the nation, you know. All right, cool. Let's get to the action now because we're all about promotion of condoms. You know, it's very key to the segment. It's very key to yes, the show. Yes, yes, So as you can see, as you can see in front of me, I got an artificial pennies mm. and the actual condom itself, a max condom. You, we all know a max condom. We get these free of charge everywhere in corner, bitch beans, clinics, hospitals, police stations, everywhere you find them. So right, up, right about now, I'm about to show you guys on how to put on a max condom. So you're just going to be checking for the expiry date in your condom first things first. You're going to check for the resisting air if the condom is not expired. And if there is resisting air in your condom, the condom is good to go. Then from there, you, you are going to like maybe push the condom slightly in towards the middle so you can be able to tear down the condom from the side. Can you see my guy? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so opening, then you're going to check. You're going to have a condom. You're going to check on which side it rolls. Then you're going to check, okay, it rolls on this side. Then you're going to pinch the tip of your condom, as you can see. Then you're going to place the condom on towards the penis itself, you know. Then you're going to slightly unroll the condom in towards your shaft, my guy, you know. Like a G. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Then, obviously, you're good to go. I mean, your condom is properly placed, you know. Then you're ready to do your thing. After doing your thing, you're going to use a towel or something to just, you know, remove the condom, you know, properly in a mannered way. Then remove, remove, remove the condom. So removing the condom, you wrap it up in a tissue, you throw it away. Then you're done with using your max condom. Safe sense for everybody. And, and, And working at the contact center, do you find that a lot of people actually don't know how to use a condom properly? Yes. Like, we, we do get calls whereby girls with, um, complain with like unplanned pregnancy and they will tell you that they used condoms but they got pregnant and you're gonna like ask yourself how did you get pregnant and but you used the condom you know 
Cheek, cheek is just those tricky, tricky things. It's sometimes it's ignorance at, at, at times for, for us. You, you know, like the peg itself comes with instructions on how to put on the condom, but we just ignorant towards that effect of reading those instructions and knowing how to do the thing. But right. slowly but surely, we are bridging the gap. By the way, congratulations on winning uh, the presenter search for being uh, the Purple Couch presenter search. Yeah, well done, bro. Thank you, thank you, thank you much. Very appreciated, eh? Uh, tell I'm very excited about it. Yeah, tell us about the show, man, because I know it's going to be on uh, Love Life's YouTube channel. Uh, it's called The Purple Couch. What more can you tell us? Um, so The Purple Couch is going to be a show that um, is for the youth, um, presented by the youth, and it's going to be a show with great, and with great insightful content. You know, um, we're going to be showcasing what The Purple brand is all about. Hence, we are calling it The Purple Couch. It's courtesy of Love Life. And with the few sponsors there and there, she conquers BY is the Department of Health coming in together. We are about to put great narrative stories into the show and for the young people out there in the in the community and the masses. And how can young people get a part and you know contribute to the show? Um, young people can just, you know, um, follow at Love Life NGO for more information regarding the, the show on all social media platforms. On Facebook, we are available. On Twitter, we are available. On Instagram, we are available. And our website itself, we are available. Like, it's Love Life, uh, www.c, lovelife.co.org. Yeah. Fantastic. Most people, yeah. Awesome, man. Sunday Le, all the best with the show. Congratulations once again. And thank you so much for the demonstration. Hopefully, you've helped a lot of people, uh, you know, watching thank this. You, thank you, my team. And uh, next time I struggle to put the condom on, I've got you on speed dial at least now. <laughs> That's it. I love you, my G. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> that is Sunday Le from Love Life Groundbreakers. Shout out to you. Enjoy the rest of your day, my brother. Thank you, Meg G. You too, my guy. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was, uh, yeah, the first episode, hopefully, of many. As a matter of fact, uh, reach out on social media, hashtag unscripted normal, and let us know if you want us to do this again. And, yeah, we'll make the parts happen. Uh, hopefully, you got to learn a lot more about gender-based violence, sexual productive health, and a lot more. Do get commenting, subscribe if you haven't subscribed, like, share this video so other people can learn and get information like you did. Uh, big shout out to Love Life for making this possible. Thank you so much to our guests. Uh, thank you so much to the National Department of Health, Soul City Institute, BY's Health, and thanks to you for watching. This has been hashtag unscripted normal. My name is Meg G. I'm Maria. Boom.